Most of the problem with building codes out there, guys, is that most people don't have an understanding about how it works in the first place. I see like in Facebook posts, for example, like I'm a part of industry groups, like I'm sure a lot of you guys are. I, I, I recognize some of you. And you'll see a guy in there be like, hey, can someone send me over the flashing code? You know, the, flat, the code for the flashing or the code for the moisture barrier, you know, something, right? And there'd be like five other people in there attaching random flashing codes and different things in there. When I see that, I'm like, okay, so the guy asking the question doesn't know what he's doing or what, he's, what the, any of this even means, right? And then all of these people that are giving them the information have no idea what they're even doing. And then the reason is because like if you don't, like if somebody asked me that, I would ask them back, I would say, well, where's it located, okay? And is it residential or is it commercial? Like you can't give them any codes unless you know that, you know, you're just guessing. And so what, what makes it even more comical, watch this, is these guys take that information and they use it and it could be completely wrong, but it works. <laughs> it actually works because the adjuster doesn't know any better. This, I'm telling you, this is a weakness of almost all adjusters. There is no, um, you know, you have to understand what ordinance and law is, but there's no course for adjusters on building. Ma'am, you're an adjuster, right? Is there, did you guys learn any, uh, uh, was there like you had to learn what the flashing codes are and learn the codes and none of that stuff. Any, anything about the International Code Council and none of that really. So you see what I mean? And I don't care where you are guys. I mean, if you're here from a different state or if you're, if you're here from California, I don't care. You know, if you're on the other side of the country, I don't care where you are. This applies no matter where you are in this country. I remember being in uh, Orlando after Irma and I was on a roof with this adjuster that just got there from Kansas City. He had a Royals hat on. I could see, I could see his face. And he was like, I, he said he just got there that, that day or the day before. And I said, I'm curious, when you guys came in here, did they give you like a crash course on the Florida building codes or something? He goes, Florida building? He goes, I don't see why that comes into play on this job. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, okay. I mean, Florida is the, the most strict, you know? So, all right, so it, it, I think people think that different cities and counties and things write their own code. They actually don't, they don't do that. They do have code, but if they don't write their own version of the building code, okay? What they do is they adopt it from somewhere else, okay? But the cities don't publish it, they don't write it. Who actually writes the codes and publishes and releases the code is only one place. And I don't care where you are, guys. I mean, if you're here from a different state or if you're, if you're here from California, I don't care. You know, if you're on the other side of the country, I don't care where you are. This applies no matter where you are in this country, okay? Probably in other countries too, uh, because that is all the codes are made by the International Code Council, okay? So it's, it's the ICC. Um, and they produce all the codes and there's a number of different uh, code books that they have. And so if you were gonna buy them, you know, this is what you're looking at here. Now, so we have a number of different code books. We have International Building, uh, International Building Code, the IBC. We have the International Residential Code, IRC, International Fire Code, you know, a fuel gas code, existing building code, international energy conservation code, private sewage, you know, international swimming. Uh, and then of course you're gonna have your electrical, plumbing, mechanical, and a bunch of other books, right? So you gotta buy all these books, right? No, you do not have to buy all these books. Forget about that. Like that's the first challenge I had. I thought I had to buy all the books. We just forget about that. We don't need to buy all these books. Um, and you know what? We really only need to focus on three of them, in my opinion, for most of these claims. I think they're all important. They all are required. The law is required on all of them, right? But really, the International Building Code, the IBC, is one of three that we need. So IBC, it's the most important, by the way. I, and I'll explain why. IBC, International Building Code. IRC, International Residential Code. That's the second one we need. We can skip right over this fire code. It's not that it's not important, but we don't, that's not the one that I want you to focus your attention on. Um, existing Building Code, it is important and it is required, but it's not the one I want you to focus your attention on. 
the International Energy Conservation Code. That's number three, okay? So the International Building Code, the International Residential Code, and the International Energy Conservation Code, which is the IECC. IBC, IRC, IECC. Those are the three code books that I want you to focus on, all right? Now, for commercial jobs, IBC, International Building Code. That's why that guy didn't know what he's talking about, right? Um, international Residential Code, <laughs> residential jobs. That's real simple, you know. So resi the International Residential Code, residential, IBC, commercial, all right? The other one, the third one, the Energy Conservation Code for both residential and commercial, all right? So do you have to use the plumbing code? Yes, you do. <laughs> do you have to use the electrical? Yes, you do. All that, all that applies too. Um, but I'm just, you don't have to focus on that. Now look, I want to show you something though. This is, this is kind of complicated to, to grasp. It was for me at least. But really, everything is based on the International Building Code, okay? That's what all this is. All of it is. And let me, let me explain why you have to separate the books though, okay? If you open up the International Building Code, there's actually in the table of contents a section for residential, okay? You go down to that section, you go to the residential section and it says all the items in the residential are required and you have to comply with them. To see those, refer to the International Residential Code. You see what I mean? Like it, it refers you over to that second book. So it is all a part of this one book, but you have to go to another book to see it. It'll say in here that the plumbing code, in the table of contents, you go down to plumbing, it'll say plumbing's required, but you gotta go over to the plumbing book, right? Energy conservation is required, but you gotta go over. So in other words, this is the foundational pillar that all, all of the other code books rest on top of, that they stand on top of. It's really all the international building code. Um, so, so that's why if you're doing a commercial job, this is really all you need, because if it was residential, there's a section for residential that requires you to go to the residential book. Does that make sense so far? Anybody know? Because I want to make sure you guys get this, man. I do. And if not, you know, see me and I'll, I'll try to help you. But I want to make sure. I really want to help you with this. Uh, okay. I want to I unlock this stuff for you. So that's part of it. So we have the IBC, IRC, and then we have the International um, Energy Conservation Codes. So if I open up the IBC, so that's the thing, like, let me go back just one second. This right here, do I have to buy these three books? No, I don't. I can if I want to, okay, but I don't. I can just go click right here, and I mean, there's an online access too that I can sign up for. That's why you see these prices over here. And those are cool too, because I mean, you, you can get like commentary and more detailed information and case studies and things to see where things have taken precedence in certain areas, you know, that were kind of too, like the building code said one thing and how did they interpret it? Valuable stuff, right? But no, you do not need that. You do not need to sign up for that. Um, and I can make that go away because here's the table of contents over here. And let's say I, we, we've been talking a lot about roofing. seems like, you know, then we know there's a lot of roofers here. So I will accommodate you. <laughs> roofing category for the IBC is in chapter 15. So I just go and click on chapter 15 and look, that paid little thing went away. And, and you don't need the book because look guys, there's the codes. Did you see me have to pay anything to get in there? Nothing at all. All the codes are right there. So whenever you're looking at codes and somebody's sending you codes, make sure you're in the right codes. You know, you don't need to go to some other, you know, site. Look and see if it says ICCSafe.org. That's the most safest way to, to know you're looking at the right code. Okay, now, but, but now, where's it located though? Where's it located? That's the other part of this. I'm sorry to confuse you. All right, where is it located? Now, the reason why it matters as to where it's located, all right, you'll see here that these all say 2021 on them, right? But we're in 2022, so why is that? Well, most of these and the three that I told you about are released and published every three years, okay? Does that make sense? So you, this is, you got to know which version we're even talking about. Okay, which year should we use? Should we just use the, the new one that says um, 2021? Because that is the newest one. And the next one's not going to come out until 2024, right? Um, 
or do we or do we use a different version? Because there's the 2021 version, there's the 2018 version, the 2015 version, the 2012 version, 2009 version, 2006 version, 2003 version, 2000 version, and on and on and on. Which version do we need to use? And the city's adopted version. That's right. What's your question, ma'am? Oh, you're just going to answer the question. Gotcha. Yeah, so I, mean, I was just kind of like a, you know, posing you guys a question, like, um, where, which version should we use, right? So, all right. The answer to that, we can start by, we, we need to look up the city where we're going. Now, so if I'm in the city of, and I, I'm using one particular city because I've done this a lot, right? And I know what I'm going to find, and I don't want to do a bunch of hunting <laughs> and take up a bunch of your valuable time. But I would do City of Frisco, Texas Building Code. City of Laurel, Maryland Building Code, right? That's how I would do it. On Google, that's where I would start. Um, and you can see right here, right away, it says Adopted Codes, Frisco, Texas. That's what I want to look for. Like you said, I'm looking to see which version of these codes does the city adopt? Which one do they say they're adopting? That's, that's all it is. That's, that's, that's what determines which version that you, that you go by. And like, there's processes for this in each city. You know, now, you might be in, a, in an area where there is no city. Maybe it's a township, I don't know what to call them out here, uh, township or village, or it might be something different. You start with the most, the smallest first, city, and then go out to county. So I would do this if I can't, if, maybe there is no city, or maybe there's no city building department. Uh, you know, then I would go to county of, such and such building department and I'd go to the county and I would look and see which version does the county adopt if there is no county building department I've been in that situation too then I would go to see which version does the state adopt but the, ver the version you must follow first is city if there is one and then county and then state in most places you're gonna find that there are adoptions at all three levels you're going to find that the city has adopted a version, the county has adopted a version, and the state has adopted a version. So what happens if the city um, doesn't adopt a specific version? So, for example, I have, I have one that I use, the IEPC, <coughs> where um, that's for repairs, correct? Mm. Well, no. I mean, yes, it is, but I don't, like, that's the international existing building code. Very important, all required. But I don't actually rely on that as much. I go off of the IRC and the IBC okay. because it, there's a number of different reasons why that is, but, but it is required. Existing building code is required. So if you can find anything in there to help you, for sure. Um, but that doesn't, their, their argument on that doesn't make much sense to me. It's all required. It's all required. And you're gonna, I'm going to get to this in a second, and I'm, but I think probably one of the next questions is going to come from somebody. What do you say when they say that the city doesn't enforce the codes, right? That's kind of where the, maybe you're going. And I've got something for that, which I'll give you. But first, though, I don't want to get too ahead. Let's find out first which version. So adopted codes. Let's go to there. Frisco. Now, first, going back and forth, right? Did you see this right here? Look at this right here. It's just, it's just populating on Google. Building inspections is seeking public comment on the local adoption and amendments of the 2021 international codes and 2020. Now, electrical codes, plumbing, you don't get confused because those are not every three years. They're a lot of times every two years. So you'll, you'll see one that's not 21. You'll be like, hey, Chad, you said, no, I'm talking about those three books, right? But that's kind of how it works. They're seeking public comment. They have a voting process. You know, they have a process that they go through to adopt those codes, right? All right, but let's go see what it is right now. So they're, they're basically, they're gonna change it out to the 2021 and they're seeking public comment, right? But there it is, adopted codes, and it shows which codes that they adopt. So we have the International uh, Building Code 2018. That gives me the answer on that. So I need to use the 2018 version of the International Building Code with amendments. The 2018 International Energy Conservation Code, IECC, with amendments. And then the, I'm looking for the residential, right? And the 2018 International Residential Code, IRC, with amendments. What does it mean with amendments? It just means that, and I'll open it up and see, what did they amend? So they're saying, we, we're adopting the 2018 version, but we are making a couple changes. We're going to make a couple you know, changes. So we're going to make it a little more strict in the following ways. Uh, and how it looks is you can, how you usually tell. And it says right there, strike through. 
So they will strike through certain words and add other words with underlines. Does that make sense? Like they're just changing a little bit. What in this particular Frisco, like in that climate zone, it's not like here, ice and water shield is not required on any of the roofs up there or over there, down there, over there. Yeah, down there, <laughs> down over there. It's not, it's not required, right? Where it is here because the colder climate, um, and that's part of this too. But the, um, the city of Frisco wants ice and water shield on every roof regardless, right? So that's one of their amendments. So it's important to check out the amendments and see what differences they might have for their city in particular. But when they say like, uh, well, I'm going to need that on city letterhead. I'm going to need that on city letterhead. You heard that before? Well, this is my city letterhead right here. <laughs> FriscoTexas.gov, you know? So like, okay, so I have a folder actually called the code game, like internally, right? And I have all the various versions. See how I have that? And now it's starting to hopefully make sense. That's how it's structured in the files you guys have access to by the years. Um, and they're just the same way as this is. And then like, so if I opened up, it's so like two, 2018 IRC. Now I have all the code snippets, right? The JPEG images for various different codes that I have found through the years tend to be the ones that they're the most valuable. <laughs> we'll put it like that, right? So now Frisco, back when I did my last Frisco, was 2015, right? But it's the same thing as what we were just looking at. I'll do a screenshot of that whole thing we were looking at. I even minimized the screen so I could fit it all in one thing, right? So I need that on a city letterhead. There you go, Mr. Adjuster. There it is. City letterhead. <laughs> like. I don't think, you, like, stop letting them, like, force you and put the burden on you to, pro to prove everything with the codes. Like, just give it to them, lead them to it, and the next thing they're going to say, you know, like, like, that objection is, like, you will hear, when you start to learn about codes and use them to your advantage, then you'll learn what those objections typically are, frequently, you know, uh, objected. And one of them is, is like, well, I called the city, and they said that they don't even enforce that. Well, I'm going to tell you that is total bogus. That is total, 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 total bogus. That is bogus. It's wrong information, okay? And it's just a matter of how you're going to be able to get that through. And I think most of the time it's because the adjuster doesn't understand anything about codes. Like, they've been taught that's a way you can get around that. It doesn't make any sense. They're, I don't think they're really doing their license any service the way they're acting with that. You know what I mean? Uh, trying to resist. They're just naturally programmed to resist. They need to use their own brain and think about their own license, you know, like build, building code, ordinance and law. It's required by every contractor, regardless of any OL coverage that's in the policy. So a way to get around that, though, like just let's assume. So I would first call the building department and see when you ask the question if that's the answer you get. Because I think if they call up, they say, oh, we've got this out of town contractor and he just thinks he just needs to rebuild the whole house with building codes and all that. You guys require that? You don't? Okay, great. You know, they don't enforce it. Who knows what that conversation was like? So I don't, I don't trust it. So I want to go and get my own source. And can you get the building department to put things into writing? Sure you can, but I would not rely on that. It's very difficult to do. Um, and it's also very difficult for an adjuster, if not impossible, for them to get somebody at a building department to put in there, it's unenforceable. We don't enforce our building to codes, you know. Um, but they're not going to put that into writing. And it was just, it's, it's very difficult that, you're, that you can get it done too. I have a guy um, that's in my consulting uh, program, and it's a mastermind. And he is a West Point graduate. He's a super smart guy. And, man, he has like a whole binder of where he's actually got him to put it in writing, you know. Um, certain things that helps them with enforcing it. But so you're not going to be able to get them, like I don't think you have to go do it. Like if they say, well, they don't enforce it. I'll say, yes, they do. Well, show me that. No, you show me. You know what I mean? Like I think the burden should be on them to show you that they don't enforce it. I don't think you should have to go play their wild goose games, you know. But if you do, if you have to go through this and it is worth it to you, just call the city attorney just e actually don't call sorry about that I meant email the city attorney it's all public information all emails can be FOIA right so like it's all it's all on the record as far as they're concerned and I would ask and if there's no city attorney maybe city manager maybe county attorney depending on which municipality we're talking about 
But I would just ask the city attorney, with, and by the way, send them with your personal email, not your construction email, with your roofing in it and, you know, or mitigation or whatever. Like send them just a regular Yahoo, you know, or Gmail, that, that just your concerned citizen. And hey, I was here looking at all the codes on your website, all your laws, you know. I'm not saying anything about building codes, just your laws, you know. The, I think there's a site you can go Muni code and look at all their codes and you'll find the uh, building codes in there too. Uh, they'll show what, what, what they adopt. And what I want to know is, all I found your laws. You guys, it looks like you published them publicly uh, on the site that I'm looking at. Is that your code? Okay, that's your laws? Okay. Are there any, are there any of these codes that I'm looking at, all these laws here, um, that you don't currently enforce? <laughs> That's what I would ask them. Is there any of your laws that you have on your code that's published that you all voted on and taken sought public comment for and you went through this real diligent process after having gone through all that, okay, are there any of these codes on here that you don't currently enforce? I'm giving you a break, right? You will get an answer to that email, you know. <laughs> you will. And that's good enough, you know. So, I mean, just like, if, it's a lot of times you have the wrong adjuster. One thing might be to get rid of the adjuster. It might be. Don't don't take that you know the wrong way. Uh, don't get rid. Don't throw them off the roof. Um, <laughs> no, but I have this video uh, a few years back, and it's still on my YouTube channel. And it's how to get the supervisor to remove the adjuster, right? And it was I had these two uh, claims, commercial claims in the Dallas area, and it was farmers. And farmers commercial was, is the same adjuster that you had to use all the time. And he's this older guy, he's real cranky, just always in a bad mood. And there's some really nice adjusters out there. He was not one of them, you know what I mean? It's not like I'm always beating up on adjusters. It's, he was a cranky, you know, he was something else. But anyway, I, I went out, I did a supplement on two, these two claims, and he actually added some money, but he, he, he didn't approve any of the ordinance and law, the building codes, they had the coverage. I mean, he didn't pay any attention to all the codes that I put in there. Uh, he added some money and just said, take it or leave, you know, he just sent out a check and just didn't even call me, didn't do anything. And when I finally get these reports, I see that he added some money, but nowhere near what he should have. It doesn't make any sense to me. So what I, I, what I do all the time when that happens is, hey, thanks for sending the money. Thanks for adding what you did. You know, now we just have a few more issues we just need to clear up. You see what I mean? Like That's how I deal with the shortages on the, the rounds of supplements. I just come back again and again as many times as necessary, as many times as I'm willing to go and like, how much is my time worth at that point? You know, what are you trading? Like, how many items are you going after, right? Um, and I did that, and he got angry, and he called back and left a voice message, right? And he goes, um, hello, yeah, I got your supplement request. I've already paid money. I'm paid all I'm going to pay, okay? And if you don't like it, then I'm going to bring out some other contractors that will, I was like, huh? I was just couldn't believe my ears. That he, and he said it in a recorded message. I was just like, so offended by that. You're going to do what? Like, no, you ain't. Like, I, I've got signed agreements. I've already been taking money from these clients. I have all the insurance money in my possession. You know, how you like me now? That's another thing. Like, when you get the money, you know, and it's in your possession, they can't drive that wedge between you and the client anymore because it's, it's too far gone. You know what I mean? Like, that's what they try to do, right? They get an estimate. That's great. That's a high. And then they don't call you. They call the client. Like, where'd you find this crazy guy? You know, like he doesn't know how to do this job. I don't know. Where'd you find? And then all of a sudden they're skeptical and people are disappearing and all that. Get the money, get the money, you know, but what I did with him was I just called and I put this on. It's all on video. You can see it for yourself, the how to get the supervisor to remove the adjuster. Right? So, and I just went through it and I put some crazy music on it and sped it up. And I, cause I, cause I was waiting on hold, you know, I just called in and called the main farmer's number, commercial or residential commercial. And I got through to some cut and I just said, I need the a supervisor for this particular claim. And I got the supervisor. Everything I'd done up to that point was all on the record. Those email copying to the inside. So that adjuster or the supervisor was able to look it all up. You guys can hear this for yourself. Um, and he, he was, and I told him the story, what the guy said. And he just simply said, you know, that, that isn't right. I think what I'll do for you, if you want me to, I'll just get another adjuster. You know, one of the other adjusters will come take care of those two for you. I was like, man, that sounds great. You know what I mean? So he was out of here. He's gone. He gave me some money. You know, he gave me some extra money. I'll take it. And now you're gone, and we'll talk to somebody else. You know, so I just think sometimes you have to be creative. You have to, 
if you don't like the playing field you're on, change fields. You know, sometimes you might be working under a hail damage claim, but it could be a wind or vice versa. It could be a, like they have it marked as wind, but it's mostly hail. Um, but then it gets shut down for whatever reason, or they don't give you the coverage you need. Um, it could, which could be because it's it's marked wrong. Um, but now, what if they file a hail damage claim? <laughs> you know, they had a wind damage, and that what happens when you file a claim, guys? Like, they send an adjuster out, don't they? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you can hit reset on a, you know, doing things differently too. Like, and it doesn't doesn't always work because they can see the open claim and combine it. But if you wait till it closed out. You know, and then, you know, filed a new one. You can't file a claim for your client, but here's even more. You can't even tell your client to file a claim. You can't. That's steering a client towards filing a claim. Attorneys can't do that, right? You can't tell your client to file a claim. Uh, we don't represent but look, look it up. You don't have to answer. You can neither confirm nor, des nor deny, right? <laughs> okay. You do not recall, right? Um, you, you can't. So, but you can say things like, hey, you know, your whole street over here, you know, they filing claims, we're working with the adjusters, they're paying, but you can say certain things, but I just want to caution you because I, I know people who have actually gotten on the phone and helped their clients do it. You can't, that's dangerous stuff. Other things, uh, don't say, that. I'm just here, since we're talking about do nots, right? Do not do. <laughs> do not say the word mold. Uh, you heard me say it earlier briefly, but don't say the word mold. Don't say the word rot, okay? So like decking, is, is rotted or you pull out walls inside and it's rotted. No, it's not water. It's not rotted. Okay. If we are talking about decking, uh, for all intents and purposes, it might be rotted, but there are like three building codes that deals with that. You know, there's water soaked underlayment, water saturated, uh, water saturated underlayment, water soaked decking and solidly sheathed decking. So it must be required. Like it has to be dry. So there's three different building codes that actually gets you the decking, nothing to do with rot. So mold, what causes mold, guys? Water, right? So mold damage usually, like or mold remediation, usually falls into a completely separate part of the policy where there are all kinds of crazy restrictions and you know cases and lawsuits and you know different things. Uh, go for it. So you start the project, you tear off the roof, and then you find mold. Yeah. You have to shut the job down. No. I mean, well, listen, I mean, you have your state, Rick, you got your state stuff and, you know, different things. My point is, like, whatever you have to do, maybe you do have to do that. Maybe you do have to do that, right? But I would still write it up as water damage with the insurance company. That's my point. Is because when you start, like, your client, there's too many clients that are saying, look at my mold, look at my mold. No, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, that's not, you know, like, I was in Galveston after Hurricane Ike, and I was standing in a home with a, an adjuster and we're standing there where the seawater used to fill it up all the way up to the ceiling right so to give you an idea how bad the water damage was like i remember looking at the wall and seeing like this it looked like coral reef like shrubbery which was mold you know it was the most craziest thing i've ever seen and we have masks on you know we're before COVID, and we're standing there and i'll never forget we're both standing there side by side and i looked over at that adjuster i said man would you look at the extent of that water damage, you know? And he just sort of chuckled. He's like, yeah, I agree, man. There's a lot of water damage. Um, you know, Florida has like uh, caps on, on water damage. But other than that, usually there's no caps on water, on water claims, right? So if you look in the WTR category, like, you, I mean, you've got the, uh, you can do air scrubbers and you've got the HEPA cleaning and all of the, all of the protocols for mold remediation can be used on a water damage job. That's the craziest thing. Like we get, just get our, we, we self punish ourselves without knowing it. You know, we just shoot ourselves in the foot, starting with the client. I mean, cause you, I've walked in so many hundreds and thousands of deals I've worked on where I'm looking up and there's black mold all over the place, you know, from, but it came from water damage. So, I mean, it's your choice whether you call it, is that mold damage or water damage? It's really both, you know, but I just choose the water damage because there's less resistance and less, less friction as far as the protocol in dealing with those repairs, if that, if that makes sense. There's another question. I'm sorry, brother. I know you, you, you raised your hand first, but he was closer. He was, he's looking at me like he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to be waited on. <laughs> What's, the, what's your strategy 
to quickly cross crosswalk the two so that you yeah can next segment them. brother next segment <laughs> all right because that's that's gonna because right now we're in the code game right now so all right to, to finalize this thing out with the code game I want to show you what is one of my favorite codes and show, just give you an idea how these codes are formatted right so they're like I said I put them all into JPEG format you guys have them all and I just want to show you know show you a couple things okay so I do you know the adoption page that adoption that I just showed you that that showing what's required in the city of Frisco that's the very first image that I even have in the images section of Xactimate that's what determines the rules of this estimate if you, if you follow me and then I follow up with what other specific codes are required so like uh, we are in 2018 IRC which is what Frisco said like 2012 drip edge became required in all the codes right um, that's so if they don't have drip edge they must have it now right but not the earlier versions so but mostly the codes really stay mostly the same there's not a lot of significant changes from the versions to you know, when they release new changes they might just be real slight changes um, but my, one of my favorite, if you're doing roofing at all, one of my favorite is this one right here. Um, I don't know if you can see it too well. I'll read it to you. But it says, existing slate, clay, or cement tile shall be permitted for reinstallation except that damaged, cracked, or broken slate or tile shall not be reinstalled. That's not the part. It's like it's almost hidden in the middle. And here it is. Any existing flashings, edgings, outlets, vents, or similar devices that are a part of the assembly, this is coming from the roof assembling category, so they're talking about the roof assembly, shall be replaced where rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. And then aggregate surfacing materials shall not be reinstalled. That's important, but not as important. And I think the difference in the versions, one of them said must be replaced. You know, they just changed it a little bit. But... So the flashings, edgings, outlets, vents, or similar devices that are a part of the roof assembly shall be replaced where rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. Okay, great. So what does that mean? So it's going to be damaged during the tear-off, right? Is that what you're talking about? Well, yeah, it's going to be damaged during the tear-off, and you could prove that probably. You can show that. Definitely you could, right? You can document that while they're doing it. You know, that's perfect. If it's rusted, you can do that now. If it's deteriorated, you can do that now. But I submit to you, it's already damaged right now because how is it installed? Nails. So it's got holes all through it, guys. I mean, you take photos of that with the building code, with a footnote, you should have it. You're gonna, the only reason why you wouldn't is because you have the wrong adjuster that doesn't understand it. You know, maybe you get a different adjuster, maybe you get a supervisor, you know, maybe you tell your, your, maybe your homeowner or your business owner tells the uh, insurance company that if it's true, because you don't ever want to lie to an insurance company, you know, um, tells them that I can't deal with this adjuster, I need another adjuster, you know, I don't feel like this, you know. There's a lot of things that can be done, you know. There's, there's always like you're getting stuck with the adjuster, but there's a lot of things that can be done to simply just get a new human, right? Because a lot of times that's what it is. It's the human perspective that one person feels a certain way and you got to get a take from a totally different adjuster. That's worked for me. So many times, you know, just getting a different adjuster on it. Um, but all these, all these codes are now yours. You guys have these. Um, are there any other questions about the building codes? Yeah, go for it. So could we use that code for um, a repair? So let's say you're paying Correct. Yes, you could. Mm -hmm. You damage the, the thing or above it? Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Also, the codes for the water, the water. Uh, the water saturated underlayment can be used for that. Can, the, cannot have, cannot roof, you cannot, if it's roofing, you have to go all the way down to the roof deck if you're doing a replacement, right? We kind of know that, like, um, well, a lot of people don't know that, actually. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't go down to the roof deck. That's against the law, so stop doing it. Um, and if, if you're roofing over top of other layers of shingles, then I'm going to have to ask you to go ahead and get up and leave now. <laughs> No, but uh, I, this guy got me recently on that because manufacturer specifications are always required also. In any type of construction, anywhere throughout all the code books, you're going to see every category. It's going to start out. It's going to end up with product specifications must be met. 
manu manufacturer specifications must be followed. So whatever your manufacturer says, if they've said it, that's law, okay? Get the documentation for that, along with the building code that says the product specifications and manu manufacturer specifications must be followed, right? Um, so that's, that's just uh, naturally law, but there is a, I think it's GAF, actually has one specification that says that under certain circumstances, under certain conditions, you can actually go over one layer of shingles. This guy told me about it and I was blown away. I was like, man, if you could show it to me right now, I'll give you a thousand bucks. I told him, if you could prove it to me, I'll give you a thousand bucks. I said, if you could show it to me right now, before this class is over, I'll give you 5,000. And he showed it to me and I, I mean, I had to pay him. I had to pay him. <laughs> so I did too. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 that, you just, that's, I hate to confuse you with that, because like I'm saying, don't pay any attention to the, the slate and all that. So this code starts with slate, clay, and cement, and talks about this first sentence. Just pretend like this sentence does not even exist. It's telling you three different things in this code. It's telling you the first sentence, the second sentence, and the third sentence. Right, none of which have to, point that out. none of them ha have to have anything to do with each other. They're independent of each other in the same code. You see what I mean? Um, by, the, by the way, so this actually can be found in the asphalt shingle section. So you, so you can take it straight from there also. Um, so, and also you can get it from the other ones too. The tile, it's in the tile also. You can go get the specific one. But it's the middle sentence. Any existing flashings, edgings, outlets, vents, or similar devices that are part of the assembly shall be rust, uh, replaced where rusted, damaged, or deteriorated. This is just one of hundreds of codes. It's just that I use it to demonstrate the power of one code. You know, go for it. Specific to the slate, though. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to just hammer one code. Yeah. But slate's going to have less, less chance of wind damage being proven in a, in a claim. Right, but what they're saying there with the slate, man, is they're saying you can't take it from one area and go put it, go reinstall it. In a, in a different you know area. the house is 100 years old. Yeah. The metal's going to be old and rusty. Right, and sure. So if you could do a repair, as you said, you do a repair that can then turn into a claim? Absolutely. Okay. It's already, it should already be a claim if it's a repair. Oh, oh. That's coverage, because if the adjuster says it needs to be repaired, that's applied coverage right there. Like, I, if they come out and say, nope, there's no damage and there's no repairs necessary, then that's a denial. But to me, I don't necessarily consider that it has to be a full replacement to be considered an approved claim that has applied coverage in it, right? Because right. if they started with a repair, no, it's no, like... No, give you a little bit. That's a Yeah, smart. that's my foot in the door. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yep, yep. One thing leads to another. Yeah, go, go for it. Um, when we're doing an estimate, in the, the very beginning, you know, you can't get away from giving that estimate. Do you want to give a full estimate, including all these little things, or do you give them Great a half question. estimate and then expect the supplement? I love the question. Yeah, I love the question because it shows where you're thinking, right? He's asking, should if I do, if I'm boxed in and I have to give them that estimate, you know, while we're doing this supplement stuff, should I give them everything, like all those little things? No, you shouldn't. You know what I mean? Great question. Because and I would tell them, like, I don't have. I got to know what I'm. You know, what you're approving before I can write an estimate. Like, so, but if you're gonna make me do it, what is it that you want me to write an estimate on again? You know what I mean? Like I'd ask them, I like what somebody else says, I turn, what you said, is I was you go to the insurance company and ask them like, hey, I'm just the contractor that was hired to perform the, the, you know, the repairs that are prescribed by you and I'm in this jam because of what you're having me do and I don't know what to do, so what should I do? What should I do? You know, go to them, go to them. What's the solution? Help me with the solution, right? Um, so I, so I don't uh, um, think you necessarily have to do that, right? Okay. So I, I think it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I'm trying to so start off playing dumb and give an estimate like they would give to you, and let them approve it, and then supplemental. Right. For that. I would, t I would tell something like, okay, well, this is the <laughs> just a preliminary estimate, so it's not binding. You know what I mean? Like, like really, there's probably going to be a lot more stuff that comes up. We'll have to spend more time with that. I know that there's a lot of building codes that come into play, uh, but this is a preliminary estimate. Um, but that's a, the, a good tactic for maybe just getting that applied coverage. Because again, if they're on the fence about giving you a repair or a replacement, and they see where you're going, they're not gonna give you the replacement. You know what I mean? That's, that's why, you uh, was there somebody else that had a question right here? Did I miss anybody? Okay. 
building codes, trying to think if there's anything else. Um, yeah. State Farm's arguing that it's not being covered. I don't know if they have the O&L coverage yet. Um, so how does that work? Well, they have to have the O&L coverage. They have to have the ordinance and law coverage in order to even get them to do anything about building codes. It, it's just, it's a policy. Whenever it's a constrained by the policy, it has to be done. You know, it has to. That's why I want to know that in the very beginning. You know what I mean? Like, hey, also, guys, we're now that we're now this little segment we just did, Imagine sitting down with every one of your clients and giving them at least an abbreviated version of this. How, how about empowering your clients on this information? Because wouldn't they insist that it be done, right? right? And also when they say, well, I have two other contractors coming out. Oh, you do, great. I want you to quiz the contractor that's coming on the IRC, the IBC, you see what I mean? Listen. The, the adjusters don't know anything about the codes. Neither do contractors, guys. Neither do contractors. This is why you gotta know it. This is your edge. I'm telling you, this is your edge. To win claims, but also to win business. And also, it's just the right thing to do if you're a contractor. You're probably already agreeing that you, you're gonna you know, comply with all state laws and all, blah, you know, all that stuff. So, and probably a number of different places. <laughs> okay. All right, so this is going to be my favorite segment, all right? And actually, we're going to take a break. We're going to take a break, um, but the next one is going to be, I'm going to tell you what it's going to be before you guys go. I call it the A bucket, B bucket, and C bucket. I think is what you've been waiting on, which is how do you respond to the adjusters when they say this, when they say that, when they say that? How do you, how do, you do it? How do you, how do you come back at the adjusters to force them into an approval? So this is going to be, I think, one of the most valuable segments of the day. We'll take a 10, almost 15 minute break and we'll come back. All right.